I'm curious, Suzanne, about how family issues emerge in the legislation that comes out of the 80s, but I think even in the 70s. Uh, talk a little bit about how legislators are responding to the changing family. Yeah. Um, again, I think that it's a lot of it is being driven by grassroots women reaching out to legislators who they think will empathize with their problems. And one of the problems that, they, that more and more women are facing in the 1970s is the rising divorce rate. So in the 1970s, um, the divorce rate doubles uh, very quickly. Um, it peaks in 1979, and there are a whole variety of reasons that that is true. Um, but it's really understood as a new phenomenon and as sort of symbolic of a larger issue of changing family structures, increasing numbers of single mothers. Um, when you say the divorce rate peaks, yeah. it peaks to what level? What's Roughly 50 percent. 50 percent of new marriages? A marriage is formed in the 1970s and, and in, in the next 25 years. And do we know what proportion of those marriages there are children involved? In some ways, what's more important than the actual, I mean, the debt is important, but the number that is used in the media all the time that people cite constantly is this 50% number. So even though there's a lot of debate about how true it is in the 1970s and 1980s, that's what people think is happening. And I think that reflects their own experience of lots of people around them getting divorced and, and marriage seeming much more unstable than previously what? did. What are grassroots women asking for to combat this yeah. problem? So they, it's interesting. What they ask for, increasingly, is better, is to change the nature of all of the laws um, that I'm sure you've discussed in earlier classes that were set up to treat men and women differently based on the assumption that in a marriage you'd have a breadwinning male and a homemaker mother. Um, so for example, as we know, women got social security through their husbands, um, typically. Uh, and that was because the husband had a right to a whole dependent benefit based on being married in addition to his own benefit. Um, when they get divorced, at first, women don't get anything. And then later they get that dependent benefit. Um, but it's about half, it's exactly half of what their husband is getting. And they start to say, wait a minute, we are equal partners in our marriages. We might be in the workforce and making less than our husbands. We might be in the workforce and making the same amount as our husband, or we might be at home. But that's a decision that we made as a couple about how we're going to divide the labor that has to happen in the home and earning income. And we should like, all of the income we get should be pooled and divided evenly in a divorce, and that includes things like retirement benefits. Um, so they start demanding that with retirement benefits, with health insurance. Things. And do they succeed in getting those, or do the laws change so that women get some of those benefits at least? The laws change, uh, and I think we can debate whether or not they succeeded. So what's interesting is that they, do, they pass about 10 separate laws that divide or give divorced women better access to their ex-husband's benefits, but it's a problem that is addressed as a divorced women's problem. Um, and so they all get, they, all those laws give divorced women access to benefits through their ex. So in some ways they remain tied to their ex if they want benefits, and it's based on the fact of them having been married. Another way of looking at it, and certainly the way many feminist organizations looked at it in the 1970s was that divorce was exposing what a problem organizing the social insurance system around the breadwinner homemaker system or structure was um, and that doesn't change at all. So if a woman remarries mm -hmm. she loses the benefits of the first husband exactly. because it's assumed that the second husband has now taken his yes. role. It's an interesting continuation. Mm -hmm. Uh, what about health care? Do women have their own health care? Um, it depends on whether or not they have a good, well-paying job outside of the home. Um, and that remains true today, right? We still have a system in the United States where we often get health care through either our jobs or our family. Um, health insurance increasingly 
in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, and 70s comes with dependent benefits. Um, and so women are really reliant on their husbands um, if, for health insurance if they're working in the home um, and don't have their own jobs. And also many of the jobs that, for example, Nick was talking about, pre-unionization that women have aren't one of the ways they're paid less well than men is that they don't get health insurance or other benefits because it's assumed they'll get it through their husbands. And divorce even now still means that women tend to lose health benefits that come through their... Through their husbands. Through yes. their husbands. Um, and and I'm, I'm thinking that the paraprofessionals who are organized, once they're organized into the union, even though they're poorly paid, they suddenly get their own health benefits. It's absolutely true. And this is one place where the public sector diverges from the rest of the post-industrial work world, working world, in that even though this work remains working class, no paraprofessional or health aid is making uh, what we'd call a kind of middle class salary, they do, through unionization, acquire some level of stability and access to benefits for themselves and sometimes for their children. Whereas work in the service sector privately, uh, in a big box store, uh, behind a desk, can be considerably more precarious. Uh, and even in the public sector, um, organizers I've talked to will talk about how many of the uh, public officials, the Board of Education members they had to bargain with, assumed that the women who did this work would not need or want these benefits because they would be seeking them through a husband. Um, Velma Murphy Hill, who was the lead organizer for the United Federation of Teachers for Paraprofessionals, reported many comments of this nature, suggesting that essentially women did not seek advancement, they did not seek benefits, they did not seek a living wage because they were inherently seeking to be, play a secondary role in their uh, in their households. You think that was actually true of paraprofessionals? I don't think it was for them and it wasn't for Velma either. Uh, she tells a story about how one of the demands for many of these workers was a path to advancement on the job. So even if these were entry-level positions, they sought the opportunity, as many workers have, in a stable work environment to earn promotions, to earn opportunities to have both more responsibility and greater salaries. And one of the things that the Board of Education told her was, oh, these women simply aren't going to be interested in taking the kinds of classes necessary to advance. Uh, they worked it into the contract anyway, and the day that in 1971 CUNY opened its doors to paraprofessionals here in New York City, CUNY's the City University of New York, uh, the lines at every office uh, of the United Federation of Teachers in all five boroughs were around the block. And so Velma uses this as an example to illustrate that, in fact, yes, people would seek out opportunities when those opportunities were made available. It's a, it's a, there are fascinating reflections of this in uh, some of the court cases, uh, some of which I've been involved with, you like the well. Sears case, where the question was whether women would take advantage of available opportunities or whether they preferred their household roles.